This is going to be lesson number 27 as we continue our study in systematic theology, the doctrine of prayer. Prayer means different things to different people. To some, it means every other option has been used. They want to think of prayer in much the same way contestants on who wants to be a millionaire think of a lifeline. They've tried doing it on their own, they don't know what to do, and now they want to involve God. Prayer falls into basically one of six categories. Supplication, adoration, thanksgiving, petition, intercession, and desperation. The last one sums up a lot of the prayers the Lord receives from some people, and has become popular in these last couple of centuries as the other five types have began being ignored. Prayer is our only communication to God. He speaks to us through His Word. We speak to Him through prayer. Unfortunately, we live in a time where most of the communication is one-sided. If it isn't just an act of desperation, and it isn't, then what is the purpose of praying? The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, so obviously it is, or should be, a central part of our life. This lesson but touches upon some of the purposes of prayer. Question number one. Do all need forgiveness of sin? What are the effects of sin? Sin is the cause of our aging. It began the corruption of our physical bodies. All of our aches and pains can be traced back to sin. Disease can be linked to it as well. The bacteria needed to return us back to the dust from which we were formed also infects us as we are living, bringing about our sicknesses. All of creation is affected by it as well. The first death was in the animal kingdom as God provided fur as clothing for Adam and Eve. God's first judgment on sin was the great deluge, the flood of Genesis 6, 7, and 8. This broke up the one supercontinent into the land masses we know today, as well as introducing seasons. If seasons had existed when mankind occupied the Garden of Eden, clothing would have been required as well. Winter, go figure. And yet that never came up until after the fall. The properties of sin on our physical bodies are painfully obvious but its effects on our spiritual existence is much more toxic. We are all born with a dead spirit because of the fall, and when we speak of the second birth, it is our spirit to which we are referring. This second birth is achieved when we pray to God to forgive us of our sin and to save us. The sin we are asking to be forgiven of is the original sin passed on to us because of Adam. We get our sin nature from our fathers, and he was the first. As Christians, our sins are the individual failings we have when we disobey God. To be useful to God, we need the forgiveness of our sins as well. We won't lose our home and glory because we can't, but we can lose rewards which would last for all eternity. Everyone has a sin nature, and because of that, everyone needs to be forgiven of their sin. Do all need the forgiveness of sin? 1 John chapter 1 and 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Question number two. Is anyone so good they don't need forgiveness? It's apparently easy for some to say that they aren't bad people. They're successful in life, which they think is an automatic approval of them by God. They give to the poor, either by supporting soup kitchens, giving to the Salvation Army during the holidays, or supporting fundraisers for various charity events. They treat everyone fairly. They don't steal from them, take advantage of them, or talk about them behind their back too much. They follow the law, with the possible exceptions of the speed limit and other various traffic laws. They like to think of themselves as role models and good people. Some of them actually lead better lives than some Christians. The problem they have without realizing it is this. Lots of good people die and go to hell. Because being good doesn't get you into heaven. But just for a moment, let's pretend it does. Romans chapter 3, beginning of verse 10, as it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Now, being good is a subjective term. Good is compared to what? Your neighbor? The rest of your family? Someone in prison for mass murdering? The acceptable subjective comparison is God. 
And the best man who ever lived cannot measure up to that impossible standard, and God knows this. That's why he didn't settle on good as a standard to get into heaven. No one would qualify. No matter how good anyone feels they are, they still need forgiveness to enter heaven. Is anyone so good they don't need forgiveness? Ecclesiastes 7 and 20. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Question number three. Where is the best place to pray? Some have seen praying as an opportunity to show off. There are some Pharisees who did this, probably the same ones who tried to ashen up their parents so that the others could see that they were fasting. Even these days, some like to make long, impressive prayers to God. And before I offend anyone, there are those who do this that are doing nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with a long conversation with God. It's the reasoning behind the long prayer that separates the braggart from the sincere. Prayers are a very private conversation between us and God. Yes, during a service, some will be called to pray, but the majority of our prayer should be done away from people. This allows us to be frank with what we are saying to God, and our heartfelt petitions aren't being used to make us look good. It also prevents inhibitions from getting in our way as well. There are certain things we say to God that no one needs to know about, and there's nothing wrong with admitting that. Scriptures speak of a closet, the Greek word being tamion, a secret chamber, wardrobe, or storehouse and it refers to a place of solitude for a chance to be alone with the Father when we speak to Him. When we're in a restaurant, our blessing of the food shouldn't be a spectacle, but should be private. It doesn't have to be hidden, just not made to be prominent. That isn't saying we should be ashamed when we are praying, but if we are intentionally drawing attention to ourselves, we should remember what Jesus said about the hypocrites of His day. Where is the best place to pray? Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 5. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Question number four. Should we be persistent in prayer? Anyone who is a parent knows what it's like when you're busy doing something, only to have a young one come up to you wanting something from you. Typically, they're awaiting an immediate response, which you can't always deliver, so you let them know that it might be a moment or more. The children are not bashful when it comes to asking you about it later, even if their persistence is only hurting their cause. As a parent, this can be extremely frustrating when you feel you're being nagged to death. And yet, this is what God desires from us. Many of the things He instills in children are what He expects from us as adults. When I was young, my dad stood in the Indian River while I was standing on a small dock a few feet away from him. He'd tell me, go ahead and jump, I'll catch you. He said to trust him. And that's what I did, because I did trust him. When he or my mother would talk to me, I hung on to every word and felt closer to them because of the conversations. Unless I was getting scalded, of course. I genuinely wanted to make them happy, to have them be proud of me. When I disappointed them, sometimes the lectures were worse than the spanking that followed, and the remorse I felt was overwhelming. And when I wanted or needed certain things, I would nag them unintentionally until I got a yes or a no. I learned at a young age that a yes might become a no, depending upon how I was behaving, but it was beyond rare for a no to become a yes. So I learned when to be quiet. This is why Jesus said not to forbid little children from coming to him, because such is the kingdom of God. It's the simple, natural faith based on love and trust. It's the desire to sit at a loved one's feet and be part of a conversation that makes you feel special. The aspiration to obey because we want to make someone happy and feel genuine guilt when we don't. And it's showing our genuine desire for something by being persistent in our prayers to him demonstrating our sincerity and dependency on Him. Should we be persistent in prayer? Luke chapter 11, beginning of verse 5, And He said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. 
And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. Question 5. Do all who ask according to God's will receive? The key portion of this question is according to God's will. Just because we ask doesn't mean our request is in his will, and many seem to be surprised when some of their requests aren't automatically approved. They'll say God promised them they'd receive if they ask, and they ask but didn't receive, so in their opinion, God didn't keep his promise. It's my personal opinion that God doesn't want everyone to win the lottery, despite those who pray for that, while ignoring many things they might be praying for. How your prayers are answered, or how they aren't, is the best indication of how close you are to being in God's will for your life. Persistent prayer, which we've just covered, works for petitionary prayer and intercessory prayer, but not for promising God you'll do such and such in an effort to get him to change his mind. Do all who ask according to God's will receive? Luke chapter 11, beginning at verse 9, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Question number six, will we then get exactly what we ask for? God isn't required to provide for our wants. He does like seeing his children happy. That's where we as parents get that notion. But many times our wants can get us into trouble. Someone I know from work was killed on New Year's Day 2019 because he was doing something he wanted. He's trying out his electric bike he'd received for Christmas out on a major thoroughfare before he was really ready to do so. One can never count the times our parents have saved our lives because they kept us from doing something we thought was fun and they knew was dangerous. Just because we want something doesn't mean we've thought through the entire process. So no one who loves us will ever just let us do what we want, get what we want, or even act like we want because they're concerned for our welfare. God has us at a major advantage here. While we deal with worst case scenarios, he knows exactly what will happen if he provides any particular want we desire. When he says no, he offers no explanation to us. We just have to accept by faith that he knows better. Our needs, on the other hand, are different. He knows our needs better than we do, whether the need is material, whether it involves a lesson to be learned, or whether or not it's spiritual. His interpretation of our needs aren't always the same as ours are. Because we can't see the bigger picture that he does, we have to trust his answer to our prayers, even if we don't understand them. So we won't always get exactly what we ask for, but we will get what is best or necessary for us. Will we get exactly what we ask for? Luke chapter 11, beginning of verse 11. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Question number seven. Why do we sometimes ask, but receive not? If everyone who prayed for a winning lottery ticket received a winning lottery ticket, the divided jackpot would almost not be worth it. In the non-canonized book of Judith, she prays for God to cause others to believe a lie she is to tell. Were this factual, their prayer would have gone unanswered. God doesn't ask his children to lie, and he would never condone that behavior. Many of the things people pray for are mammon, things that would come between them and God. Not necessarily right away, but when something can be made to come between you and God, or make you feel less dependent on God, why would he give you a gift-wrapped stumbling block? Remember, Anything we ask that is already forbidden in the Bible is dead on arrival to God's altar. So asking permission to commit a sin will always be a no, because God doesn't ignore a white lie any more than he would dismiss an act of adultery. We get a positive response from God when we ask for things that are in his will. We will never get the same result when we ask for something that he has forbidden or that goes against his plan for our lives. Usually, if we look at the prayers that haven't been answered, we might already know why it hasn't. We just want to deny it. 
And of course, sometimes it's actually just a matter of timing. God, in his infinite wisdom, with all of history laid out before him, might have said yes, but at a future date. We have to trust him, and we should know never to ask him to break his own rules. He won't, and we'll just end up disappointed, but hopefully not surprised. Why do we sometimes ask, but receive not? James chapter 4, verse 3, Ye ask, and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Question number 8, What did Jesus tell his disciples to pray for? Every believer has the same purpose and goal in their lives. Some deny this. They think it's something reserved for ministers and deacons, and they don't give a lot of thought or concern to it. But bringing the loss to Jesus is the focal point of why we remain here after we are saved. If we weren't expected to lead others to Christ, Jesus could just take us right to heaven the moment we're saved. Yet obviously he doesn't. The Great Commission was given to the church, but not as an organization. A church is its membership. So when the commission was given to the church, it was given to the church members. For centuries, the regular churches dumbed down its members by forbidding the word of God to them, which allowed them to redefine salvation, to repurpose them to be little more than financial support for them, and to act as tattletales about anyone else who believed differently. Things like witnessing were left out, and what was considered important or relevant was left to the priests. The local New Testament church expects each and every member to be a soul winner by the lives we lead, the knowledge of the word that we've required, and the personal relationship we have with God. Prayer should always be the first part of anything we do, and witnessing is no exception. It gives us the guidance we all need in this most important work. What did Jesus tell his disciples to pray for? Matthew chapter 9. Verses 37 and 38. Then saith he to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Question number nine. What is importunate prayer? This is a term used for an urgent, determined prayer. Typically as a result of something traumatic happening to someone when speed is of the essence. Someone witnessing a friend having a heart attack will do all they can do to save their life, all the time offering an importunate prayer silently or under their breath. These usually aren't the wordy prayers done in King James English. Sometimes there aren't even words involved in these prayers. Romans 8.26 Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. At times when we are overwhelmed, unsure what to say, or simply beside ourselves because of the situation, the Holy Spirit, our constant companion, intercedes directly to the Father for us. The Bible records a case of importunate prayer for us. Matthew chapter 5, beginning of verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast, and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread, and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Question number 10. What remarkable prayer is spoken of in the Old Testament? Ahab was a terrible king in Israel. In fact, he was the worst king Israel ever had, and that's recorded in the Bible. He had built groves to Ashtaroth. He'd raised up not only an idol to Baal, but a temple as well. He also married a Zidonite princess named Jezebel and made her his queen. Now, a non-Hebrew queen would automatically be an idolatrous. 1 Kings 16 tells us that no king had ever provoked God to wrath more than Ahab did. 
then Elijah the Tishbite came on the scene for an unasked conference with Ahab and spoke to Ahab of a prayer he had made. All remarkable prayers spoken of in the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 17, 1. And Eliahu the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew or rain these years, but according to my word. James chapter 5, beginning verse 17. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Last question. Is there a promise of salvation to those that call upon the Lord? Did you ever think about the fact that you cannot be saved without prayer? It doesn't have to be a fancy one. It doesn't have a minimal time limit. It just has to get to the point of the prayer. Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 13. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. God has never turned down anyone who sincerely prayed that prayer. Prison ministries are filled by people who have committed acts of atrocity, yet prayed that prayer, and are now children of God with heaven as their eternal home. When anyone calls on him, he has promised to save. Is there a promise of salvation to those that call upon the Lord? Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In conclusion, to a believer, prayer should be something more than what we do before we eat. To speak to a friend, we simply call or we drop by and visit. To speak to a local politician, we probably have to jump through a couple of hoops. National politicians would require more hoops, and more than likely, you only get a staffer who says, I'll pass on your message. World leaders are someone you'd need to know, and their staffers, own staffers, would tell you that your message will get passed on. But to speak to the creator of the universe, you simply bow your head, bend your knee, or think to him. You'll get him every time because he loves listening to you. The topic doesn't matter either. Just remember to look to his word for his side of the conversation. When we ask for something, remember to ask in his will, and in his time our prayers will be answered. When we sin, a prayer of repentance doesn't require grace time. We don't need to dwell on what we've done before asking forgiveness, and we shouldn't feel scared to approach God. Just remorseful. The more we read God's word, the more we'll understand his plan. The more we pray, the more we'll see our role in that plan.